Thank you for downloading this podcast from The Reedy Clubby Show on Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. For more, please go to 702.co.za or capetalk.co.za. Choose to make a positive impact. Lead SA. Talk Radio. Talk Radio 702 and 567 Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Chris, good morning. Hi, Reedy. Good morning. Well, we spent the morning tackling a, a terrible scourge in our society, that of rape. And it's interesting, some of the research that has come through from the Medical Research Council that has uh, estimated that only one in nine rapes are reported. And they advance various reasons for this, uh, one of them being that the criminal justice system is often biased against uh, the survivor and uh, the survivors are not trusted, that they are looked at with suspicion. I'm curious to know, how does trauma affect the brain and how does it influence a victim? behavior mm, these are very somber questions and it's a very somber subject so i'm really glad that you're raising this and it makes a huge impact for people who are victims of these sorts of crimes not just rape but many things which involve violent crime or this sorts of things which which impact on people very badly and part of the reason for that is that when we suffer a really severe trauma it can leave a person with a mental scar so the physical scars which are bad enough and can include things like physical injury risk of acquiring uh, in, of infectious diseases like hepatitis or hiv those those can have something done about them or we can give vaccines to prevent them but inevitably there are also mental scars and these can take much longer to heal and they can leave a person robbed of their self-confidence they can leave a person feeling frightened to go out they lose their normal joie de vivre so they don't want to do anything so it can be very corrosive to a person's future and one of the reasons this happens is because of post-traumatic stress and we're beginning to learn a lot more about this now and what we now understand is that when someone is subject to a sudden very uh, unpleasant situation that the brain forms a very powerful memory of that experience and this memory is consolidated and the triggers which uh, cause that memory to be invoked can then trigger uh, all of the uh, other experiences that went along with the original memory mm. in other words the sensations that were being felt the visual experiences and so on to be replayed in the person's mind almost in pinpoint detail and we now understand that this is because that when it first happens to a person you get a, a release of stress hormones and these seem to trigger the formation of very powerful memory circuits in the brain connecting the parts of the brain that are concerned with fear and trauma with the parts of the brain that lay down these memories but luckily there is some hope because uh, scientists at the University of Oxford in, in England have found that if you take people who are subject to some kind of violence or something that might cause them to develop these very very profound memories for these events if you in the short period of time after it's happened distract the person uh, so in other words you give them something to do which is mentally engaging but totally remote and different to the experience they've had then it interrupts the formation of the strong memories so they're less likely to develop this PTSD syndrome and they did this by showing people violent movies and then either getting them to do something mindless or getting them to do a cognitive test for a, a while afterwards and they found the people who did the taxing mental cognitive test were much less likely to report PTSD-type symptoms afterwards when asked to recall these movies. So we think that the wrong thing to do when a person has been subject to a violent crime is to then spend hours grilling them in the police station because it, actually what you can do is consolidate the memory and make it more likely to happen. And so we need to be careful how we uh, follow up with people who've been victims of these sorts of crimes and also then rehabilitate them to make sure they don't develop these nasty symptoms. But I do urge anyone who's got those sorts of symptoms to get some help because mm -hmm. they can be reset. You can help people to get rid of those memories and work through them by eff effectively exposing themselves to them and, and learning to control them and then the, the effect goes away. Mm -hmm. But they do need help. So it's one thing to stop it happening in the first place, another to help people who are already victims and they need help too. So we we yeah. should urge them to go and get some help if they can. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks indeed. Our lines are open for you. Anything that you want to ask the Naked Scientist, please uh, use the platform. Give us a call 021-446-0567 011 Joe in Kempton Park. Hi. 
Good morning. Mm. Morning, Dr. Chris. Hello, Joe. I have, I'm a COPD patient. I'm on, um, stuck at home now on permanent oxygen on a machine, an electrical machine, oxygenator. Now, what's confusing me is when we have a power failure, I'll go onto a oxygen in a, in a bottle. And I find I use far less out of the bottle than I do out of the machine in terms of liters per minute. We are told basically that you've got a 17% of oxygen in the normal air we breathe. Can you give me an idea of what kind of percentage we get out of an oxygenator machine and or out of a gas a bottle? Hi, Joe. I don't know what device you're using, so I'm going to have to talk really generically. So if anybody yeah. listening knows better, please tell us. So I'm just going to speculate a bit here. The, the way those oxygenator machines work is that effectively they are, well, there's a range of ways that they work, but they can enrich the proportion of oxygen you breathe in. There's about 20% oxygen in room air. And this means that you get a little bit more oxygen going through, and this means that you get a little bit more oxygen going into your bloodstream, so you feel a bit better. Uh, if it's coming out of a bottle, it's possible that what's coming out of the bottle is uh, richer in oxygen than the oxygenator machine is capable of supplying, and therefore you are breathing a little bit less hard, or the bottle is having to deliver a little bit less gas per minute in order for you to get the same concentration of oxygen to be breathed in as you would normally from just room air. That would be my suggestion, that basically the, the differential concentration between the bottle and room air means that you need less out of the bottle than you do out of the, the room air in order to get the same concentration that makes you feel comfortable and breathe easy. Thank you very much, Joe, and good luck to you. Roy in, Ca in so Cape Town, Seapoint. Hi. Sorry. Roy? Hello, yes. Mm. Um, Chris, you know, if you shine a, a light through a, a five centimeter beam of, of glass, then the light is going to be bent and it's going to lose some energy in heating up the glass. And as it comes out, it's going to still be shining at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, what I'd like to know is where does the energy come from to speed up the light as it comes out of the glass? Because it's slowed down as it's in the glass. And if one could assume perhaps that there's a continuous flow of energy and that's speeding up the light again as it comes out, what would happen if you put one photon through the glass? Would it still speed up to 300,000 kilometers per second as it came out? And where would that energy come from? Hmm. Hello, Roy. Uh, what a lovely question. So what we're exploring here is the process of refraction and what, what Roy is referring to is when light goes from one medium, let's call it air, into another medium which is more dense, that could be glass or water, then the more optically dense medium means the light slows down a little bit when it goes into that medium. And this has the effect also of causing it to bend, which is why lenses work. But then when it leaves the more dense medium, we can measure the speed of light as having speeded up again. So to us, uh, who are used to the world around us that we can see, that's like your car slowing down, going through a Ford in the road, and then speeding up again suddenly, and you need energy for that, so why should this happen? Well, with light, it's a little bit different, Roy. What is happening with the light is that, you're right, some energy is being dissipated when the light is going to go into the glass, because the glass is going to get warmer, because some of the energy is going to be absorbed, so the light will be a little bit dimmer when it comes out the other side, potentially. But you will still speed up to the speed of light without needing any more energy for the following reason. When the light, which we can think of as a changing electromagnetic signal, goes into the glass, then it's going to interact with the electron cloud around the atoms in the glass. And this is going to cause the electrons to wiggle up and down, and you can think of this as a bit like a weight bobbing up and down on a string or a spring. And when the uh, electrons wiggle in this way, there's a small delay, there's inertia. So it takes a little while for them to pick up the energy, bounce up and down on their spring, and then transmit that energy onto the next electron, and the next electron, and the next electron. And it's actually that, that time delay of the electrons catching up that slows down the light. They're not having to lose any energy or an appreciable amount of energy to do that. And these phonons then propagate the light through the material and then they regenerate the electromagnetic wave 
on the other side of the material, and of course th then it's in light again, then it's in air again, so it's going to travel at the, the full speed rather than this slowly retarded speed uh, in the more optically dense medium. And if you put one photon through, if it came out the other side, it would come out at the speed of light because it basically hadn't lost any energy in the glass. It might be that on one or two unlucky occasions it might uh, dissipate all its energy and you wouldn't get anything out the other side apart from some much longer ro wavelength radiation, which is infrared, because when, when it loses energy in the glass, it heats the glass up, and this turns the light into uh, infrared, which is longer wavelength, which the glass is then going to re-radiate out. Thank you very much, Ree. Thanks indeed. Uh, let's go to Tony in Panorama in Cape Town. Hi. Morning, Ree. Morning, Chris. Mm. Um, um, last week I bought a, a, one, a small um, grenadella plant, and I planted it outside, and it was it just just in a little pot. And, and then I thought, well, this is a climber, so I, I put a stick next to it, probably about 10 centimetres away. And then I, I hung a trellis against the wall, which I thought I'll, I'll train it to go up. Well, practically overnight, the, the grenadella plant had actually put out a tentacle and wound it around the stick. <laughs> and and it's already heading for the, for the trellis. Now, how does it actually know where the stick is? <laughs> 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 it's a clever plant. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, absolutely. What happens here is that the plants are wiggling around all over the place and they're very sensitive to when they actually hit a solid surface because they, they can sense the deformation of their stems against a solid surface because when they're just flopping around in the wind, there's no net movement that they can't make. But when they hit a surface which is... Uh, rigid, then they know that that side, I say no, um, I'm, I'm sort of y using the word in a loose way, the plant senses and then reacts to the fact that there is a solid surface there, which triggers the, the formation of uh, effectively an asymmetry in the distribution of, of growth hormones in the stem of the plant, away from the side which has hit this rigid surface. And this causes the plant to then begin to grow more on the side opposite the rigid surface so it has the effect of twisting the plant towards the rigid surface then of course a new bit of the plant stem hits the rigid surface so it then grows more on the side away from that so it goes around in a coil and superimposed on that is what we call a phototropism the plants are always trying to grow towards light so they're going to go upwards and also therefore round in a spiral and this has the effect of, of making the plant grow but also anchoring it to a, a useful rigid surface quite amazing <laughs> Quite. Tony in Panorama, thanks indeed for the call. Is it Andrew? Thank you for your patience. Good morning, Andrew in Pretoria. Uh, good morning, Chris. Good morning, Riddhi. Mm. Uh, my question is, and uh, I think this is a global question, um, if I go back to two and a half thousand years ago, when the Greeks were fighting the Persians with the bow and arrow and the spear, uh, that was two and a half thousand years ago. If I go back another thousand years, is 3,000 years, three and a half, and then another one is four and a half thousand years. Their uh, weapons and tools should have been very primitive. In the meantime, in Egypt, they were building pyramids. Now, I don't think the Egyptians at that time, they were that cleverer than the Greeks to be able to build pyramids. And uh, maybe there is an explanation about uh, uh, the Atlanteans and anti-gravity because... Uh, the idea of uh, putting thousands of people to roast stones and cut granite 100 tons uh, of weight and carry it 70 miles from the quarry is not acceptable to me. Thank you very much. Hmm. I'm not really sure what I can add. <laughs> um, weren't people interesting in the old days, probably, is what I can add. And it's interesting because these days we take it for granted. The Earth's a very small place. You know, we've got such good communications that knowledge spreads incredibly rapidly around the planet. A discovery published in London on Wednesday night is in South Africa a couple of minutes later. And as a result of shrinking the globe, advances and that kind of thing are shared rapidly. But historically, if you lived in one part of the world, you would probably never leave your own country because mm -hmm. it was impossible to travel. I mean, you were relying on foot or, or horseback. And therefore, if you had knowledge, knowledge tended to be a local commodity. And people were fiercely protective of their knowledge as well because I think, well, I think they were fiercely protective of their knowledge because with knowledge came power. And if you had the ability to fend people off or, or fight and become more successful because you knew how to do things, you're not going to give 
give those secrets away readily because then your enemies will also acquire them and use them against you. So I, I think that, that um, today's modern world is much more based on trust and working together and better communications, whereas historically we didn't have those communications, so people could become incredibly advanced in one thing, but mm -hmm. they may not have other basic skills in other directions. Jacob in, um, in Midrand, hi there. Yes, Reddy and Chris. Um, my question is related to the previous caller. It, it really is about the role of Africa in the development of science. Um, you know, we, I mean, you know, I'm a, I, I, I did a bit of science, but um, very little has been said about pre-Egyptian African uh, science development. Now, now we know that uh, uh, long before there was an idea of Europe, Africans were looking to the skies, they started building pyramids, they started mathematics, and in fact the Greeks attribute to, to their early scientific learning to the uh, Nile River civilization, which became, became Egypt. So I just want to know uh, from Chris, uh, you know, to, 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 to see whether he can add more in terms of what we're discovering um, that, you know, and, and also affirming as the role of uh, Africans in, in the development of science. All right, Chris. Hi, Jacob. I must admit that I know almost nothing, and I'm embarrassed to say this, I know almost nothing about African science history. Um, but what I will say is that you make an important point when you say that people were looking towards the heavens and so on and using it to inform what what they did and their behaviour. And it's clear that this is not just restricted to Africa, but probably many, many early humans would have looked at the stars and a, been in awe of them because the night sky would have been a lot better for them than it is for us because we've got pollution with lights all over the place and big cities to spoil it. But it definitely made a big influence on them and they used it to their... To, to inform their behaviour. And if you look at uh, Aboriginal history in Australia, mm -hmm. you find that the Aborigines knew that when there were certain configurations of stars in certain places in the night sky, that this was a time when you should go and look for certain foods or that certain animals would be mating so eggs would be available or chicks would be available for, for catching or water would be in a certain place. And that's reflecting the fact that obviously the Earth is on a journey around the sun and therefore the night sky is going to change in a predictable way and you can use this to inform what you do. People began to build boats thousands of years ago and, and, and go navigating across big stretches of water and they needed a way to navigate and when it gets dark you need something to look at you'd have looked mm. at the stars so people were pretty resourceful and they must have got that from somewhere we know we know that all of modern humankind came from uh, an african origin and therefore uh, a lot of that uh, knowledge must have been passed on to help people get out of africa and begin to populate the rest of the world so it's something I think I'd quite like to spend a bit more time learning about. So thank you for prompting me to think about it, Jacob. Wonderful. Beautiful question. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Caroline in Khaburoni, Botswana. Good morning. Hi, Reedy. Thank you for taking my call. I want to know, I thought that uh, stainless steel doesn't rust, but I've just recently bought a new set of stainless steel saucepans and they're rusting. Now, is it because rust is a fungus and there was another container in the cupboard that was rusty that contributed to, to the stainless steel saucepans rusting or what it was the cause? Hi, Caroline. Well, I can't speak for the provenance of your stainless steel. <laughs> um, but stainless steel <laughs> is effectively a form of steel that has a certain ratio of iron with a little bit of carbon and some other bits and pieces, including some chromium in it. And... Mm. It shouldn't go rusty, but rust is the oxidation state of the metal. And what that means is that iron can react with oxygen in the air to form iron oxide, which is the orange stuff, the rust. Normally what happens with the stainless steel and that kind of thing is that there is well, probably several things. One is that you have other chemicals in there like chromium, and these form a, a, a layer on the surface of the iron having reacted with oxygen that stops oxygen getting further into the iron so it stops it rusting and they can also themselves these chromium ions and things sacrificially what we call sacrificially protect the iron because they can oxidize instead of the iron and fall off so that normally protects the iron if you've got rusty streaks appearing it might be that either the composition of the stainless steel is a bit off mm. and it isn't what it says it is 
or that the uh, metal has been damaged in some way, allowing oxygen to get at the metal. I'm not sure which of those two it will be. I do know a very good metallurgist who I will ask. Um, I will probably see him today, and if I do, I will ask him why Caroline in Botswana's stainless steel cutlery uh, is not up to scratch, um, and what she can do about taking it back to the shop. Okay, absolutely. I was just about to say that sometimes it's a matter of life and death. I like buying kitchen stuff and pots and if it promises that it doesn't uh, uh, experience this rust, then you do pay for it. And when that happens, it feels like the entire world <laughs> is falling apart. So, uh, so Caroline will have an answer for you next week. Solly in Selby, hi. Hi, morning, Rita. Morning to your guest. Mm. Uh, I just want to ask that uh, normally when I'm having the acha as part of my meals, ne? After a while, it will come off uh, of my armpit. So what is the cause of that? Um, it's, it's mango pickle. We call it acha. It's a, it's a, it's a oh, brand. Okay. It's, it's, it's a certain brand uh, called acha, but it's mango pickle. I don't know if you've ever tasted it, right. Chris. It goes uh, very well with, uh, with the curry. It sounds delicious. I mean, mango chutney with curry, fantastic. Something like that, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but what is the what is the question about the armpits? You know, it, 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 it does. I've I've experienced it as well many years ago when I was a child. When you eat this this pickle, somehow the next day or a couple of hours later, that's why I don't go anywhere near it. Your armpits, the sweat that's oh, coming from I see, your armpits, comes smell, out. Yes, I get it. Yeah, it yeah, comes yeah. out of those pores. <laughs> It's Got it. Yes, <laughs> right. Yes, great question, and I th and this is basically the garlic phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we've also discussed on the program the whole question of this thing of beet urea, where if you eat, and you yes. said, Reed, you eat lots of beetroots, and 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 you see uh, a visible manifestation in what leaves the body later of the red colour. Well, this is because various vegetables contain chemicals which are not completely broken down in the body. And when they go into the intestine, the food is broken down, these chemicals are liberated, and some of them can dissolve in the bloodstream. And they're also water-soluble, which means that eventually the kidney gets rid of them, but they can also secrete into your sweat and saliva. They secrete into your sweat, saliva and breath, which is why garlic can make you a bit whiffy, and it can come out through your skin. But so, so do these other chemicals. And I strongly suspect that what's happened to, to Solly when he's having his mango, and, and mango chutney, and, and you, Reedy, is that there's something in there which is added to give flavour, either from the mango itself, although I doubt it's the mango, I suspect it's something else they've added to the chutney mix. Mm. And this gets absorbed into your bloodstream, goes around your body, and because your sweat glands are taking water out of your blood and turning it into sweat, this chemical is also going across with it, and it'll be some kind of chemical, probably with sulfur in it, if it's smelly, because usually sulfur-containing molecules are smelly molecules, or maybe a bit of nitrogen, and it's water-soluble going into the sweat, and because you're sweating most in places like your underarms, you're going to notice it there the most, but I think if you were to look on any body surface, which is, has the capacity to sweat, you would probably be able to detect traces of these chemicals in the sweat, and it's because it's basically leaving your body, having gone into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And Solly, let me give you some advice. I don't go anywhere after eating the mango pickle, so uh, don't stay <laughs> away from it. I tried that for a while, but there's certain foods that demand uh, acha, the pickle. So Solly, what you need yes. to do is buy your curry or make your curry at home, have the acha and make sure that whoever is next to you is someone who loves you, loves you, loves you very much and wouldn't mind and then only venture out into the streets the next day. Okay, Solly. <laughs> All right, Chris, thank you very much. We'll chat to you next week. All right, Reedy. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. And uh, we will podcast this conversation. Why is everyone looking at me so weirdly? Is there something... Is did I do the wrong thing admitting that this has happened to me? It has. And when it did happen, okay, you don't want details. Acha, I've started. Let me just finish. When, 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 I, I stopped eating acha because the one time I had half a teaspoon. I kid you not. Half a teaspoon. And within a couple of hours, that's what happened to me. So I stayed away from it for years and years. But come on. Hands up those of you who are able to eat maguinya, fit cook, without acha. It's not possible. They don't taste the same. So I visit my grandmother whose house is right next door to a store that makes the best maguinha in Orlando East. And then my husband, um, uh, his practice is opposite a store that makes the best maguinha in Deep Kloof. So, uh, you know, there's no hope for me. So you buy your maguinha, you buy your acha, you eat at home and you stay home until the smell has dissipated. And then the husband has to put up with me. <laughs>